I'm Addie and this is Books and Tea Time. So today's video is kind of a new or sort of unconventional video on my channel and it's also super late. So I actually recorded the other clips in this video I think almost three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, because I was originally planning for this to be a vlog and I was going to vlog my week-long reading challenge and then I got no content filmed like at all. All I got was my review of all of the books so I ended up turning this into like a mini wrap-up but also just me talking about the books that I read. So today is going to be a mini wrap-up slash a review or summary of my reading challenge because I decided that I wanted to use my Jessie's deck of TBR cards for the very first time because I finally have free time to read. Uh, I just finished uh, my undergraduate degree at the very beginning of May and I finally had a chance to play the TBR card game and so I did. But if you don't know what these are, uh, this is a TBR card game created by Jessie from Bowties and Books. They have a bunch of videos where they usually they do their monthly TBR based on the cards that they pick, which is really cool. But I wanted to do a weekly, a week long challenge. So I have a video that I'm going to show you guys where I rolled a dice. Usually Jesse rolls two die, but since I only had a week, I only rolled one <laughs> and I rolled a five. So I picked five cards and then I matched them to five books. And I'm going to talk more about what books and what cards I picked. But first, I just want to say, if you are interested in getting your hands on your own set of TBR cards, I'll have the Etsy shop link for Jessie's Etsy page linked down below. And I'll have Jessie's most recent TBR card game video that they posted, um, just so you guys can get a feel for uh, what the cards are all about. And if you don't subscribe to Jessie already, what rock do you live under? go do it right now. Pause this video, go to their channel, hit subscribe. Just trust me. So I rolled a five and I picked these five cards. I'm just going to quickly read you the prompts. So the point of Jesse's deck of TBR is to approach the books that you want to read with creativity and inclusivity in mind. The first card that I picked is the Secret Lovers card, a book you've wanted to read for many years. Uh, I kind of adjusted this just to a book that I've wanted to read for a while and it actually is a graphic novel not a book and that is Paper Girls. Volume 2 for the Secret Lovers card. I read volume one last year, really liked it, so I thought that I would pick up the second volume. The next card that I picked is the Get Global card, which was perfect for the month of May because I got to fit a lot of my Asian readathon TBR into this card, and that is a book not set in Europe, the USA, or Canada. So I picked two novellas actually. I squished two of the books to match this card, and then I matched two cards to one book. I hope that makes sense. But I decided to listen to The Empress of Salt and Fortune and When a Tiger Came Down the Mountain by Nevo. They're two novellas and I literally binge listened to both of them in one evening. They're incredible. I cannot recommend them enough but again I'll get into my review in a little bit but I read those two or listened to those two with uh, for the Get Global card. Then I picked the switch up card and it is a format you really read like e-reader, audiobook, etc. And for this I decided to read Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong which is a collection of essays and I don't really read a lot of essay collections and this was also on my Asian Readathon TBR so I squished it into this prompt. Then uh, because I read two books for the Get Global card and I still hit my five book quota, I decided to match these two cards to one book. The first one is ABC, uh, read a book where the title starts with the first letter of your name. And my name is Addie, so I had to do an A. But also, I originally matched this to the Tochi Oniabuchi card, and that is to read a work of Afrofuturism. So I matched these two to An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. This is gonna be kind of an abrupt 
shift because we're going back in time like three weeks ago and I'm gonna just show you the clips of me reviewing all these books and sharing some summaries, synopsis, my thoughts, my opinions, my ratings, etc. Spoiler alert, I really loved all of these books a lot so uh, I hope you enjoy the wrap up, the review, the sit down and chat moment we're about to have together. So it is currently Wednesday, May 12th at 10 o'clock. So I did complete the challenge and read five books in seven days. I read two novellas, one graphic novel, one collection of essays, and then a longer science fiction novel. What I actually ended up doing was reading two books for this card kind of on accident because I loved the first one so much and I read two books in a series. So for the Get Global card, I told you guys that I was going to be listening to The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Ni Vo and this is a novella and I finished it in one day. I found the audiobook on my library's website. I finished it in one day and I loved it so so much that I listened to the second one that same exact day which is When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain, I think when a tiger came down the mountain. So I ended up reading two books for the Get Global card, which allowed me to switch a couple things around later, but still hit my five book goal, if that makes sense. Let's start with The Empress of Salt and Fortune. In both books, our main character is a cleric and a non-binary individual who is traveling around rural China, gathering stories from individuals who who were present for major historical events in order to go back and write those stories down for their order of like for their organization. Uh, our main character's name is Chi and Chi has a bird companion that can talk. So this is where like the magical kind of element comes in. So Chi has a bird companion named Almost Brilliant and they travel around together. In The Empress of Salt and Fortune, Chi and Almost Brilliant are traveling to go attend the like coronation of a new empress but on their way they meet a handmaiden to one of the previous empresses the empress of salt and fortune and her name is rabbit and so they stay with her for a few days and explore her house and they keep finding items in her house that spark these memories and Rabbit shares those memories and it kind of comes to be this whole storyline of her time as handmaiden to the Empress of Salt and Fortune and it's really really wonderful. First of all I will say I listen to the audiobooks but I fully intend to buy physical copies and then reread them and annotate them because I just feel like I even though I enjoyed it so much, I just felt like I was missing things, like moments were slipping away that I didn't want to forget. Like, I want so badly to be able to read quotes to you guys, but I listened to it and I didn't have time to write them down. But I will be purchasing them and rereading them in the future so that I can collect some quotes from them. I think the best way to read this book and to experience this book is to have a physical copy but also listen to it while you're physically reading it. And I know that sounds a little bit extra, you know, and I don't disagree, but like if you could like buy it for yourself or borrow it from your library in physical and borrow it from the library in audio, the audiobook is so relaxing and enchanting it absolutely transports you because the narrator like whispers to you it's like borderline asmr if you know what i mean the narrator is so delicate and hushed and soft spoken but there's still like so much emotion in the language it's so hard to describe but i definitely think the audiobook is great but at the same time i do feel like i'm missing out on something by not having them in the physical so i will be getting them in the physical for sure. I will say that the first book has a really nice twist at the end that I didn't really see coming but it was nice to have that there because I feel like for the most part I was just like along for the ride with this because like I love fairy tales, folk tales, things like that so I was kind of just along for the ride and then all of a sudden at the end there's this twist and I'm just like oh my gosh what? And now again, again, I want to go back and read it because I'm just like, wow, that's really, really great. If you like oral storytelling or like the oral tradition, if you like folk tales, if you like fairy tales, I think you would really, really love this. It's a really short, quick novella, but it definitely is just like an absolute gem. I gave The Empress of Salt and Fortune 5 out of 5 stars. Um, It's just 
it's a great time. I, I really don't have any complaints. I loved Chi and Almost Brilliant. Rabbit was a really cool and interesting character. And even though it's a little confusing, especially if you just read the audio, because I think it took me a little bit longer to understand the structure and setup of the book where all of these objects are sparking memory for Rabbit that she then shares. It's still really, really wonderful, and I think that a lot of people would really, really love it, so I highly, highly recommend it. I knew immediately that I wanted to pick up the second one, and then when I went to order it through my library, it was already available to borrow, so I borrowed When a Tiger Came Down the Mountain, which is the second book. I loved this one just as much, if not a little bit more. I think for some reason this, this story just really struck me a lot more. Um, first of all, tigers are one of the most fascinating, beautiful, and amazing animals. I love tigers, so I think that definitely is contributing a little bit to my bias. But this story, uh, my one complaint about this is that Almost Brilliant isn't in this book. There is a reference to um, them being somewhere else. I was a little disappointed not to have Almost Brilliant there, but honestly the story was so good that I feel like it kind of makes up for that and I really 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 hope that we're gonna get more installments in this series. I kind of hope and expect that we would. But anyway, in this one, Chi is traveling by themselves and Chi is being escorted to the this way station and this person has a woolly mammoth creature of sorts and they're all traveling when they encounter three tigresses and this is another like magical realist element of the story that's really fascinating is these tigers can take a sort of human shape from what I understand and they can talk and communicate with other humans and so what happens is that these three tigresses are really really hungry and they want to eat Chi and their traveling companion and they procrastinate that event happening by telling their version of a story to the tigresses and then the tigresses tell them what they got wrong or what humans got wrong from the story and tell their own story and it's a really interesting like comparison between like the same story but like different traditions telling that story and what the major like things that come out of it kind of like telephone you know so the major differences and they're comparing them so that was really wonderful but the story is about a tigress who must woo her lover who is a female scholar or an aspiring female scholar and she has to basically like woo her lover out of leaving her to go be a scholar at this like prestigious academy kind of. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on though but basically it's just a recounting of the love story. It was really really good. I loved it. Again, the ending doesn't really have a twist, but it definitely has like a, a pop, so to speak. Also, Nevo is coming out with her debut novel in July or June, I think, and I'm so excited for that. Now that I have read or now that I've listened to these, I have absolutely fallen in love with Nevo's writing style. The novel is called The Chosen and the Beautiful, and it comes out on June 1st, 2021. So yeah, I'll put a picture of the cover up so you guys can see it. It looks stunning and I'm just really excited. Next, I doubled up two cards to one book. I originally didn't want to do this. I wanted to really challenge myself to read five different books, but because I read both of the novellas in Nevo's series, I decided that I was going to allow myself to double up on these and cut out uh, one of the books that I had originally planned and I decided that I am going to use the ABC card and the Totochi Oniobuchi card for An Unkindness of Ghosts because I'm an idiot and I didn't realize A it's right there first letter of my first name I could have used it for either of those so I am going to double up this but only because I still ended up reading five books and I figured that that was an okay cheat moment but Oh my goodness, is this book amazing. I had high hopes for this and it definitely delivered. I love River Solomon. This is their debut novel and then I believe The Deep is the next novel that they published but I read The Deep first last summer and absolutely loved it. I'll have a card to the video where I read it and review it if you guys want to go back and watch that. I also am pretty sure it's in my best 
in worst books of 2020 in the best category. So I had a lot of high expectations for this and it delivered. River Solomon did it again or I guess did this first and then did the deep. I don't know. The point is I absolutely loved this novel. I highlighted it to holy heck I picked a bunch of different colors, I tabbed it up. River Solomon is a non-binary author. I, I cannot get enough of Solomon's writing. It's, it's clever, it's witty, at times it's funny, it's also like sharp and poignant and it's just beautifully complex and insightful at every turn. There's something that I wanted to highlight and underline and comment on. I have a couple quotes that I'm going to read out for you guys that I thought were my favorites, but first, overall, what is this book about? So, this book takes place on a, like, massive space vessel that is transporting the remainders or like transporting humankind to the promised land or to another planet in the future because Earth has been presumably destroyed. And so they're on this spaceship, but the spaceship that they're on is organized much like the Antebellum South. And so our main character, Aster, lives in the lower decks, in the slums of the ship, and is essentially treated as though she were enslaved. The, uh, the people who make up the low decks are often people of color, and they are forced to work these, like, indoor plantations kind of I mean like it's inside a spaceship but they've like created a space where it's like almost as though you were outside like there are like fields that need to be cultivated also forced to be and are also confined to the low deck spaces so they cannot physically ascend without permission from an upper deck person but also there is no class mobility really. Okay, Aster is a, a healer I think she's technically like a botanist. I really like all of the sci-fi components of this although I feel like some of it does go over my head where I'm like is this fake science fiction or is this real science that I just don't understand. Uh, I think for the most part it's like science fiction that is made up but it doesn't really hinder the narrative at all. Uh, it's really amazing to see a black woman in like a stem field or as a healer as a doctor in her community that was really great representation aster also i believe is autistic um we don't ever get a direct diagnosis for what she has but there is a very interesting quote you're one of those who has to tune the world out to focus on one thing at a time we have a world for we have a word for that down here women like you insula inside one it means you live inside your head and to step out of it hurts like a canning. We get frequent hints like that um, that are not direct diagnoses but that suggest Aster is neurodivergent which is really amazing, cool to see again, and interesting to see how she mediates her environment around her to make herself comfortable. This book also does a lot exploring trauma and the lasting effects of trauma on your relationships with other people because obviously a lot of the people in the lower decks have experienced different kinds of trauma. The guards often will sexually assault or abuse the women and there is a strict hegemonic understanding of gender that is placed on individuals so there is a lot of trauma and Aster's best friend and someone who she considers to be her sister's name's Giselle they have a lot of difficulty and a lot of struggle just because they both have their own traumas and they they present differently and they respond differently to those so that was a really wonderful piece of this narrative that I wouldn't have really expected but that I think I was really I really enjoyed it because even though it was incredibly difficult to read and it was frustrating sometimes to read Giselle I feel like I learned so much about how trauma affects your friendships your personal relationships your romantic relationships your family relationships and the like so it was really wonderful to read that and then lastly and then another major thing that I really wanted to mention that stands out to me is that River Solomon is so, so good at commenting and philosophizing, I don't know if that's a word, about memory and 
history and the importance but also the consequences of memory and basically the ambivalence of memory and how it is both a painful thing to have to hold a memory and to specifically hold memories of trauma or to relearn or to learn and carry on teaching a history that is traumatic and that is painful on the one hand that is true but on the other hand it is so important and valuable to remember and to carry out that that cultural oral history of what's going on and what has happened and I have a quote about that. Um, Aster is actually sharing a memory or recalling a memory which actually is really cool that she's recalling a memory about her aunt teaching her about the the process of actively preserving memory and so um, it says but we remember, we remember, we must try to remember even that which has been forgotten. You got to document. That's what our work is as women folk, memorating any way we can. Do you count yourself among us? Aster is remembering that her grandmother and her great-grandmother, all of the generations of women in her family had passed down this camera and every generation would take a picture with the camera and only one picture because you could only have so many. Um, each generation is responsible for that and responsible as women for preserving and creating that memory, which I thought was really wonderful. Uh, even though throughout the entire text, Aster and her romantic partner, Theo, and so many different characters are pushing the boundaries on gender and rejecting the gender binary and Aster and Theo both are questioning. Overall I gave this book a four out of five stars. I really highly recommend it if you like science fiction. Um, if you like science fiction that has a little bit of mystery to it, there's definitely like a mystery thriller component to this that I really loved. I I know that River Solomon is coming out with a new book this year. I actually think it just came out a few weeks ago. It's called Sorrow Land and I cannot wait to read it. I, uh, I told myself I wasn't gonna buy any books this month, but next um, I read for the Switch It Up card, I read this collection of essays by Kathy Park Hong called Minor Feelings and Asian American Reckoning. As you can see, I tabbed the hell out of this. I highlighted so much. This was such a wonderful and again, insightful read. It was great. Oh, this is like part memoir, part essay collection, part um, like artistic and literary criticism collection. It's really unique, I think. I mean, I haven't read many essay collections, but I think it's unique in what it puts together in that sense and the structure that it takes on. Kathy Park Hong is the daughter of Korean immigrants, um, so she is Korean American. This is another book that I was planning on um, reading for the Asian Readathon and I'm really glad that I knocked it out and it's still only halfway through the month so maybe I can add more books to that TBR list. A lot of this book is structured around memories or specific recollections from Hong's life up until this point. Uh, there's one chapter that kind of hones in on her time in college. There's one chapter that hones in on her experience cultivating her style as a poet. One thing that I didn't expect with that I really liked is I didn't realize that Hong was a poet. Um, although since reading this I've put all of her poetry collections on my Goodreads list but I didn't realize she was a poet going into this so when I got to chapter two specifically and I was reading all of her commentary on poetry and liberal arts while she was in college versus now when she's writing this and just how it's changed but also how it's kind of stayed the same a little bit just as an English student it was kind of really refreshing so if you are an English student in any capacity, whether you are writing, literature, or even film studies major, I think you, or if you have that interest, I think you would really like this because it's, it's an undercurrent throughout the entire text that she is using her, her expertise and her skill in poetry as um, part of her writing, and that was really cool. And, but like the second chapter is called Stand Up, and it's all about her watching stand-up comedians and using stand-up as 
in parallel to her own poetry style to help break from the rigid expectations put upon her as an Asian woman writing poetry or just an Asian woman writing anything. How the academic space and society in general tries to force her into a box in terms of what she's allowed to write about and that you want the Asian experience to be told. Publishers want the Asian experience but they want the Asian experience to be one monolithic thing when it's not and so she uses humor and stand-up and what she calls bad English to subvert those expectations and so that was really really fascinating. Uh, she also mentions so many other Asian individuals and Asian artists and weaves their own life stories into the essays in such an organic way that's really heartbreaking at times but also really fascinating and cool to see again how she experiments with structure and with style and writing to communicate this Asian American reckoning which I thought was really wonderful. I do have a couple quotes here because again like it's just it's just better in the author's words you know but uh, this is the first one I think that really struck me. I highlighted it, put a big star here, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to read it out to you guys. Whatever power struggle your nation had with other Asian nations, most of it the fallout of Western imperialism in the Cold War, is steamrolled flat by Americans who don't know the difference. Since Trump's election, there's been a spike in hate crimes against Asians, most pointedly Muslims and Asians who look like Muslims. Um, I found this quote so valuable and especially worth sharing to me because it's part of this this comment and other parts of this book are breaking down the that expectation of Asia as a monolith because in this section she's pointing out that many Asian countries are at war with one another or have histories and tensions with one another that are a direct result of Western imperialism and the Cold War and essentially the West's presence in Asia and how their presence has deteriorated relations among different Asian countries. Just before I finish up this review of Minor Feelings, I had one more quotation from pages 101 and 102 that I wanted to share. The rise of white nationalism has led to many non-whites defending their identities with rage and pride as well as demanding repara reparative action to compensate for centuries of whites plundering from non-Western cultures. But a side effect of this justified rage has been a stay-in-your-lane politics in which artists and writers are asked to speak only from their personal ethnic experience. Such a politics not only assumes racial identity is pure while ignoring the messy lived realities in which racial groups overlap, but reduces racial identity to intellectual property. Read it yourself. Honestly, that's all I can say because I'm not doing it justice and I can only say that I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is a great essay collection. I gave it a four out of five stars, but I think anyone can go into this book and come out more sensitive and more educated and that, that it's especially important right now to read this and other texts that make us aware of and able to better see and call out Asian hate and anti-Asian action because it is such a problem right now especially in America. It's something that we need to be able to see and that we need to be able and when I say we I mean white people like myself. It's something that I need to be able to see and point out to people and say this is anti-Asian. This is this is racist. It's just a really delightful memoir and it's rather short so I highly recommend that you try it out. Last but not least I decided that I was going to read a graphic novel because I wanted to read something quick so that I could finish the five books in seven days but also because this has been something that I've been wanting to read for a very long time and that was the prompt for the secret lovers card and that is volume two of Paper Girls by Brian K. Vaughn. I read the first volume in 2020 and I really really liked it. I got volumes two and three for Christmas and I've been dying to read them and I finally picked up the second installment. It is wonderful. The art is amazing. I mean, uh, I love the art style. Also, one of our characters is an Asian American individual, Aaron, uh, right here on the front cover. Uh, Paper Girls is so hard to explain because I am still, after reading the second volume, so confused. 
but basically it's about this group of four girls who have a paper route and uh, the first one takes place on like Devil's Night right after Halloween, right before Halloween. I don't even know when Devil's Night is, but it takes place on Devil's Night and they all have to deliver papers together in groups um, for, to like protect themselves because like a lot of crazy people are out on Devil's Night um, and a bunch of wild stuff happens. There's like time travel that's not really time travel, there's dinosaurs, there's like bugs, I, 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 I have no idea. There's a time machine, there's time traveling individuals that I thought were aliens but that are not aliens. There are definitely dinosaurs that I still have no idea where that came from but it's like the girls are from the 80s and in this second volume, they go to the present in 2016, so it's kind of the present. Um, but then there are also people from way far in the future involved. It's just... It's funny. It's charming. I love all of the girls. The art style is amazing, but I am constantly confused. Like, I, I cannot really tell you anything about it because I, I have no idea. So I think that... You know, I mean, I'm only on volume two, so maybe I'm meant to still be confused. I mean, I generally know what's going on, but then every time I think that I know what's going on, something crazy happens, and I'm just like, who, what? I don't know, but I'm, I'm kind of just okay with it. I'm along for the ride, and it's wild, and it's crazy, but you know, I don't care. It's exciting, so yeah, that's that. I gave this a four out of five stars again. Um, really my only complaint is that it's incredibly confusing and it's fast paced in a good way but just a little, a little crazy for me. Well, that is my challenge. I am honestly a little surprised that I finished five books in seven days. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it but I'm really pleasantly pleased. I'm pleasantly pleased with myself. Thanks for stopping by my channel. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Also, I just wanted to say, Jesse is so so close to 30k. So if you're watching this video and you don't already just and you don't already subscribe to Jesse of Bowties and Books, please please go watch one of their videos, any of their videos, and you're gonna fall in love with them and subscribe to their channel because they deserve it. They deserve the world. They should have millions of subscribers. And if you're interested. They, I believe the Etsy shop is open right now. Uh, they have an Etsy shop for their TBR cards. Again, so cool. This game was so fun. I already want to do it again. So you will definitely be seeing more installments of these TBR challenge videos inspired by Jesse's TBR card. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for supporting my channel. I really, really appreciate it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if that's your jam. And I'll see you in the next one. Happy reading, happy writing, and happy living. Bye!